Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwin Robinson. And today, we are carrying on the conversation around the Feel Younger diet. We've previously done two other episodes, so please make sure you check those out. And today, we're really discussing about the fine-tuning of the Feel Younger diet and what it means to meet all of your micronutrient needs. So tell me, Elwin, why did you want to bring this topic up today to our listeners? Well, our filling a diet episode was popular, but uh, a little bit of feedback was it was not full of uh, specificities, which was on purpose because, of course, every person needs to find the, uh, their own unique diet that suits them. So the first part was really more about, which I still stand by as the most important element of choosing the right diet for you, is eliminating the things that don't agree with you. However, despite that, um, I wanted to give some guidance about you know, how to select from what is left for you. For some people, that might be a lot because there's not many things that they have an issue with. And uh, so we did that in a previous episode. And um, because I went quite in depth, we really only tackled the macronutrients. So the macronutrients are the three sources of fuel or calories, protein, carbs, and fat. And we didn't even get into a massive amount of depth about uh, those, I don't think. Like, we didn't talk about every type of essential fat or every amino acid, but we went into enough detail. It was practical stuff, right? Do you get where do you get protein from? Is it uh, red meat? Is it uh, milk? Is it chicken? Is it beans? Whatever. It was all that kind of practical stuff. So, in this episode, I wanted to kind of finish that off because, of course, there is more to nourishing yourself and being nourished than macronutrients. I stand by that macronutrients are the essential starting place. Why? Well, you know, for a lot of reasons I said in the last episode, but just to recap a couple of them, uh, blood sugar is such a huge deal. A lot of people think that insulin resistance is like the root cause of all kinds of uh, uh, chronic diseases that plague us. And I would say mismanagement of blood sugar is one of the root causes of insulin resistance. And of course, everyone agrees that stress is really bad for us. And mismanagement of blood sugar is perhaps actually the number one cause of stress inside our, you know, biochemistry, even if it's not, you know, we think of stress as, you know, this person's upset me and this this is freaking me out or whatever. But actually it's, you know, it's a lot about how we respond to things, which is a lot to do with how our blood sugar is. So we talked about all that. So it's super important from that angle. It's also super important because when you get the right levels of macronutrients for you, you will be fueled to have the highest energy possible. Another reason why it's super important um, is because when you do not have the right macronutrient balance for you, you will not feel satiated and you are far more likely to overeat. Another reason why it's super important is if you have too much of the wrong macronutrient that doesn't work for you, you're liable to develop serious issues related to the organ that or organs are affected by it. So for instance, if you are not very well equipped to deal with dietary fat and you're getting the majority of your calories from fat, sooner or later, that's gonna cause a problem. Same for carbohydrates, same for protein, although less common for protein, but for all of them. like it's So you, it's very important to get the right balance. So anyway, that's why we focused on that. I guess that's a quick recap and advert for that previous episode. You should definitely check that out because it is of primary importance. However, micronutrients are also super important. You know, the phrase which I've used far too much, Chris, you're probably sick of hearing it, uh, <laughs> you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. So... Whatever your weakest link is um, will tend to be the thing that limits you and undermines all the progress you should be making because of all the other wonderful things that you're doing for yourself. Uh, But just one thing missing, just a lack of, you know, vitamin B7 or just a lack of, um, uh, you know, uh, molybdenum or I'm picking kind of purposefully vague things that most people haven't heard of can completely undermine your your health and well-being. So it is important to touch base on that. So I don't know how much we're going to be able to cover in this episode. Um, And I know you have some questions prepared as well, Chrissy, but we'll try and go for at least some of the major issues that you should be aware of. I don't know if we'll cover every micronutrient, but we'll focus on the ones that it's easy to not get enough of, um, especially, ironically, often when you're trying to be healthy uh, and eating you know, a very selective diet, whether you're on a carnivore, or whether you're on a vegan, or whether you're on a, a paleo or whatever. Uh, all these diets, while they have some benefits, they also have drawbacks of um, limiting your pool of potential foods 
and therefore limiting or increasing the chance you might end up low in a particular micronutrient, even if you get better levels of some other ones. And of course, that's not limited only to people on specialized diets. Um, if you eat you know, the same terrible <laughs> junk food every day, then that's gonna, you're going to have that problem as well or whatever. So yeah, it's a common issue. Micronutrient deficiency is very, very common. Probably the most common that everyone knows about and talks about these days is magnesium. Very few people uh, get enough magnesium. And, you know, spoiler alert, it is very difficult to get enough from food, especially if you're really deficient, which is why most people who, even those who don't like supplements, do recommend supplementing magnesium. And having tried and tested a lot, my conclusion is that magnesium glycinate uh, is the best form that actually works, that actually raises red blood cell levels when I see it in tests. Um, it's not maybe the only one. For some people, you know, different things work. That's great, but that would be my go-to. So that's a supplement. That's not what we're going to be talking about today, but that's like an exception. Uh, almost everything else you should be able to get enough from food unless you just have an issue with those foods. And we'll talk about, you know, that case by case. Uh, before we get into all those specifics, though, I know you have a bunch of questions, Chrissy, that may address uh, what, you know, I kind of have vaguely arranged to talk about so no perfect yeah that brings up my first very uh, you know beginning question here which is what are the major nutrients that we can't get enough of from our food and where can we find them so that depends that's a case-by-case -case basis but yeah to answer the question so magnesium i've definitely answered that one already um vitamin k2 is pretty tricky unless you eat a lot of fermented foods uh, cheese counts as a fermented food. That's probably the most popular fermented food. And yogurt, yogurt, uh, that counts as another one. But even those are not like massively high. They probably have a, what's the word? Uh, keep, you, uh, keep you okay level of vitamin K2, but they definitely don't have an optimal level of vitamin K2 that would help to you know, reduce calcification of and your soft tissues. So that's pretty hard to get enough of from diet. I was going to ask with these, are there any signs or symptoms that we would know, like if we were deficient in magnesium or if we were deficient in vitamin K2 other than testing? Uh, yes, but for most nutrients, the symptomology is pretty broad. And so you don't know if it's that or like a dozen other things to be sure without testing. There are some exceptions to that. And I, yeah, I mean, I can give, you know, so the obvious common things for magnesium are uh, anxiety, um, difficulty sleeping, um, chronic tension in the muscles, which can include like the, you know, the bladder, for instance, that's kind of a, a common way that it manifests, but any kind of twitching, but that could also be, you know, potassium and, and various other things. Um, so I'm trying to think. So magnesium, you know, it's necessary for over a thousand enzymatic processes in the body. So because of that, the, the ways that it could help. Oh, and low energy. That's the other kind of classic one. There's so many other ways that it could go wrong. And, you know, it could be uh, weak, brittle bones and yeah, all kinds of things. But yeah, I wouldn't limit it to anything specifically, probably beyond anxiety and muscle tension. Those would be the two I'd go to as the most obvious thing that would start off with magnesium. K2, um, I suppose actually brittle bones would be the most obvious thing for K2. But yeah, like tissue calcification generally isn't something that you notice until it's already a problem. But if you <laughs> if you are uh, noticing that's the case because you have a high you know calcium score from a cardiologist or something like that, that would be a definite sign that that's worth paying attention to. Okay, all right. So yeah, but so then beyond magnesium or K two, what are the other nutrients? Okay, so to go for the list, uh, B one is one I've talked about before. B1 is uh, also known as thiamine, vitamin B1 or thiamine is one that is so difficult to get enough of from nutrients uh, and deficiency of it was so common. And this is quote unquote real deficiency, like medical deficiency, not what I would call deficiency, which what I really mean when I say deficiency usually is suboptimal. Um, but an actual medical deficiency called beriberi was so common uh, just over 100 years ago that the governments of most um, developed countries mandated that it be added to all grains, like a fortification program. And because of that, it became severe deficiency, medical deficiency became a lot less common. Although even that is something that is kind of contested because some people claim that 
you know, Berry Berry is now misdiagnosed. They just they just say that it's other stuff instead. Um, for instance, you know, B1 is very important for blood sugar regulation and the more carbohydrates you take in, the more uh, B1 that you need. Uh, generally, B1 medically is only ever given to like alcoholics. Uh, sometimes they'll give them like injections of B1 and perhaps people who've gone through severe stress and trauma, but uh, it's pretty unusual that it's given as a medical treatment these days. And yeah, a lot of people feel better when they get it. Um, so B1 is one that's hard to get enough of from food. It's again, one that I recommend most people supplement. Not without magnesium, because you can actually end up more deficient in magnesium if you have high dose B1 right. without magnesium. And would a B complex be enough if somebody needed to supplement for that B1, or should they take an, a B1 as well as a B complex? Uh, enough, yes. Certainly to prevent beriberi or those kind of stuff, depending on the B complex, but generally, yeah. Um, is it optimal? I mean, that's probably a different episode. You know, I think we've talked about that already, where sometimes. In the case of B1, certainly not all nutrients, having way more than you need can actually be beneficial. But yeah, you can certainly get enough from a B complex in most cases, unless you're severely deficient. Uh, so B1, uh, B12, if you are avoiding all animal foods, is a, you know, a possibility. Heme iron, if you have an increased need and you're avoiding animal foods, uh, again, uh, iron can be an issue potentially. Uh, zinc, if you're avoiding all uh, animal foods. Uh, molybdenum, if you're avoiding all plant foods, <laughs> actually. It's not very high in most animal foods other than liver, which I don't recommend. We don't recommend on this channel um, because of the high levels of other toxins. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm just trying to think in terms of any other nutrients. Not really. Like, um, now, there's exceptions to that. I, I'm more talking about if someone answering that first question is if someone has a very broad diet. Now, if someone has specific exclusions, which I guess I've already given a couple of examples of, but here's why I mentioned B12 anyway. Because even though B12 deficiency, I think um, like 70% of people on a plant only diet uh, have signs of B12 deficiency, but I think the stat is 30 or 40% of people, even on an animal based diet. Um, have some degree of B12 deficiency. What do you so, think causes that B12 deficiency? Well, B12 is not really um, like something that is in an animal. It's actually a product of fermentation, again. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing, some people have this um, genetic variant where they don't produce enough of something called intrinsic factor, which helps with the absorption uh, of B12. So it's a combination of diet and uh, assimilation absorption factors. I know that some people have genetic variants, that means that they need more. So they might be getting an amount that is adequate for an average person, but they are they just need more. And so they're not getting enough for them. And it is, you know, serious enough that the the free nutrients that doctors routinely actually test for in terms of looking for deficiencies rather than they often test for magnesium and calcium and stuff, but that's more imbalances with electrolytes rather than deficiencies. So the three nutrients they actually test for deficiencies are iron, which I've mentioned, uh, B12, which I mentioned, and then folate as well, um, which, uh, you know, I didn't mention it's, it's usually more tested around people who have signs of anemia or um, again, who are on a very restricted diet. Although plants in that case, you know, there's plenty of folate in plant-based diet. You're actually more likely to end up with a folate deficiency if you're on an animal-only diet than if you're on a plant-only diet. So, you know, <laughs> they do vary. Well, previously, you also mentioned that if somebody's on a very restricted diet, and I know um, just in what you were describing, um, if somebody's, you know, not eating, if they're avoiding animal proteins or if they're just eating strictly only um, a vegetarian diet, you know, then these are the things that they need to look out for. But let's say somebody like you did mention, is eating a wide variety. So they, they're thinking like, I should be fine, you know, but let's, but then they get their tests back because they test and then they realize that they do have these deficiencies. Then, you know, one, what would potentially be causing that? And then is supplementing the only way or should they try and let's say they don't want to supplement and maybe they just want to, you know, eat more of that food to get it. Is that a possibility or do they actually need to really invest in some supplementation? It's a good question. All right, so there's a few answers to this. Let me see if I can remember, if I've memorized them all by heart. Um, number one, 
foods are often uh, lower in nutrients than they used to be, specifically plant foods, but really animal foods as well, because animals are eating the plant foods. So this has got to do with uh, soil degradation, uh, over farming of soil, uh, not caring about the levels of anything other than the, f the f there's three uh, minerals that are required to actually make plants grow, and that's nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. All the rest, your calcium, your zinc, your molybdenum, your copper, your whatever else, um, if it's in the soil, great. If it's not, doesn't matter from the you know agricultural industry's point of view because it's not essential to make that plant grow. Now, is it essential to have enough of those nutrients in the soil to make the plant maybe more resistant to pests and diseases? Maybe. Maybe that's always been the mechanism that was in place that prevented people from doing this until recently, where we developed pesticides and herbicides, uh, which kind of protect the plant despite being weak because of a lack of anything other than NPK, they call it, uh, those three minerals. So yeah, there is definitely that. So there's the agriculture answer. Second of all, there is the, okay, it's in there, but can you get it from the food into your cells issue. And again, we've talked about this before, but just to review, um, from the food, it has to be digested and broken down by things like your saliva, your stomach acid, your pancreatic enzymes, your uh, bile, and then your small intestine, especially, and also large intestine, have to work effectively at getting those nutrients into um, the blood supply. So that's the next step where things can often go wrong. We'll talk about this a lot more in the digestion episodes. Next, we can maybe get it into the bloodstream by being absorbed through mainly the small intestine. Uh, but does that mean it's actually going to go to the cell where it needs to go? Now, this is the part where it's honestly least likely to go wrong, but it's still possible. There still could be reasons why it's not uh, getting into the cell when it should be. And so that could be another thing that's going on. And that can explain sometimes where you have all the symptoms of a deficiency and yet your blood test results show that it's fine. That could be because it's in the blood, but it's not reaching the cells. And uh, vitamin B12 is one where this is not commonly seen, but I'd say more frequently seen than other is where the test results are normal, but the person's still having a lot of deficiency symptoms. They then take mega doses of B12 and they start feeling better. So like somehow the adequate levels in the blood were not enough to get into the cells. So, so that's another answer to the question. Um, another answer to the question is that a person could have an increased need compared to the average. Now, there could be several reasons for that. Number one could be genetic. It could be nothing that you're not doing anything wrong, not your fault, you just need more because your body needs more for whatever reason. It's not as good at converting it into the next step. It's not as uh, good at assimilating and utilizing it, um, whatever. And so with it's not as good as making its own, like in the case of some nutrients like choline, where your body can make its own, but it doesn't do it very well, or creatine or whatever. Okay, so that's another thing. Uh, another issue potentially is that your body um, is utilizing more because of things that are your fault, or at least under your control. Uh, so stress, famously, for instance, causes an accelerated utilization of a lot of nutrients. I personally have never seen a Nutravel, you know, and that's one of the things that you refer to as well, Chrissy, where someone doesn't have an elevated need for at least one B vitamin. Uh, does that mean that everyone is, you know, walking around with severe, def severely deficient B vitamins in their diet? I don't think so. Uh, a lot of people are actually even on B complexes and they're still showing that. Uh, I think it's because the elevated level of stresses increase the need of these nutrients. Now, when I say stresses, what do I mean? I don't just mean paying for the mortgage, arguing with your, you know, whatever. <laughs> I also mean uh, toxins. Toxins are a stress. Um, all kinds of environmental toxins, blue lights, I guess, at night could be defined as a toxin. We've talked about, you know, the pesticides and this and that and all that kind of stuff. So all of that can increase your need of nutrients. Um, so can um, various things that are not even bad for you. Like I just gave one example there. If uh, you're going to take more K2, then make sure that you have magnesium with it. Sorry, no, not K2. If you take more B1, 
then make sure you have enough magnesium uh, to go with it, for instance. So, you know, that's something to be aware of. Um, if you are deficient in vitamin D, for instance, then you're going to need more calcium. The more vitamin D you have, the more effectively your body absorbs calcium. So if you have low vitamin D, then you're going to need more calcium than if you have vi high vitamin D. So there's all those kind of um, fine-tuning issues, potentially, that you want to be aware of. Oh, I guess vitamin D, I mentioned the free nutrients that doctors test. Vitamin D, to be honest, that is, you know, more and more these days, it's like the fourth nutrient um, that they do also test for quite frequently these days for deficiency. Um, so, you know, we talked about with B1, you need more B1 uh, in the presence of stress and toxins, but also in the presence of uh, more carbohydrates. The more carbohydrates you're using, especially simple sugars that have more of an impact on blood sugar, like a, more of a spike, uh, the more B1 you need. And the more alcohol you drink, the more B1 you need. In fact, the more B vitamins you need in general. So that's like a few examples of you know, how it can vary off the top of my head. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good list. It's a good list. Yeah. So then, you know, going into the other, the uh, second part of that question, which is, you know, does, if somebody's really, you know, not maybe wanting to supplement, could they get more by eating foods or do they really have to supplement? Case by case basis, really. Um, it is better to get it from foods in most cases. One quick tip I will give though is, it is true that what all the skeptics of supplements say that if you just take a supplement like a b complex or whatever on an empty stomach your body is a bit like oh my god where's all this come from like it's not natural which is why i generally recommend except for in specific cases where you don't want to do it this way but generally and i do it with almost everything i always have it with food because if it comes with this complex of, you know, all the macronutrients and all kinds of other micronutrients and phytochemicals and this and that, and then there's a bit more B1 or a bit more K2 or whatever, it's not such a shock to the body. It's like, oh, it's a bit more, like it's still a bit of a, oh, that's weird, but it's not like, <laughs> oh my, you know, it's not like coming yeah. out of nowhere for the body. Um, so that is a way to make it more like food, I would say. And obviously use the high quality forms that are found in food, not the cheaper forms, you know, in some cases. I won't go too deeply into that because this is supposed to be an episode about diet, not supplementation. Um, so to answer the question, in most cases, yes. However, we can go through it case by case, but, you know, it depends on um, how freely you're able to eat and how freely you want to eat. So I'll give an example. It's pretty difficult to meet like your calcium requirements if you do not have any dairy. And butter isn't going to do it either. So I'm really talking about, you know, milk, yogurt, cheese, whatever, like actual dairy, not just the fat. Now, there could be reasons why you don't want to have dairy. Maybe you're trying to lose weight. Dairy is, you know, fairly anabolic. Maybe uh, you have an allergy or intolerance to it then you just can't have it. That's that. Uh, maybe, you know, it's nothing severe, but it just, you know, bungs you up a bit, mucusy, you don't like that. Okay. Maybe you're against it ethically because you don't think it's fair to, you know, steal uh, milk from a baby animal. There could be lots of reasons why you don't have dairy. That's totally fine. But it's not particularly easy to get an optimal level of calcium if you avoid dairy for decades. And I say it that way on purpose. Look, I'm not saying if you skip skip like dairy for a day or something, you'll have a calcium deficiency. No, but I'm saying if you have decades without it and then you're not really aware of it, so you're not supplementing with it at all and you know maybe the foods that you're having that you think are high calcium, like maybe some of the green leaves, you don't realize that all the calcium is bound up to like oxalate and not really utilizable by the body and stuff like that. And I say this as an example because I was someone in this position. I end up with, uh, you know, lead toxicity for a lot of different reasons, not the only one. But if you check the WHO's guidance, they say one of the risk factors for building up high levels of lead is a lack of calcium in the diet. And sure enough, when I checked my calcium intake, it had been about 200 milligrams a day for over a decade. I quit dairy at that time, you know, over 10 years before that. And um, the recommended amount is at least 1,000 milligrams a day. 
that's the government recommended level. Uh, some people say even more, 2,000 a day is good. Some people, of course, say less is good because they worry about calcium, uh, calcification, sorry, of the tissue. So everyone's got their opinion on this. But I would say having such a low level of calcium for such a long time did not do me any favors. It was not a good thing, not just because of the lead thing. Uh, there are all kinds of other essential functions for calcium, and I do feel better now I've had some. Now, calcium supplements, along with iron supplements, are probably like the worst way of getting a nutrient. Like, if there's anything that I recommend people it's better to get from food, it would be iron. And then second place to that would be calcium. So, but of course, if you don't tolerate dairy, you're not necessarily going to have a lot of choice. So people talk about ground up eggshells. That's not particularly appealing to most people. Um, <laughs> there's bones, like bo bone broth, but bones are full of toxins. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Owen. I was going to ask you why why those two in particular, is it better to get from food instead of supplementation? Uh, so iron, because iron supplements often disagree with people. They cause digestive upset. They're just not absorbed very well. Um they also seem to feed, like iron does feed lots of pathogenic organisms. And it seems like if it's just pure in a pill, then that's easier for the organisms to get to versus bound up in a food. Um, and yeah, in the case of calcium, it's something similar. Uh, there are better ones these days, like um, calcium, I've seen like these days bone formulas of calcium hydroxyapatite which is the type that's naturally found in bone. So I don't know enough about it to say it's definitely a good idea, but I'd say if you're going to have any calcium supplement, then that would probably be the one I'd go for. Uh, but like calcium carbonate, um, it's just poorly absorbed and it's a stress on the body. I guess that's the simple answer. Same with the iron. It's poorly absorbed and it's a stress on the body. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were discussing about there's more potentially more toxins in, in certain things. So I think you were talking about bone broth. Yeah, eggshells, bones, you know, they, they, yeah, they do build up some nutrients, but they also build up toxins. So I was saying there isn't really a good food source of calcium to easily get 1,000 milligrams a day that's actually absorbable and utilizable by the body. So that's an exception. Um, but I'm trying, you know, I mean, I gave a bunch of exceptions where it can be difficult to get it from food. But generally, yeah, you, uh, you can get it from food. I, um, you know, th th there are interesting things like, uh, now I'm not saying this is a good idea for everyone and we're going to do this, we're going to talk about why not, probably not in detail in this episode, but in next episode where we're going to talk about different types, where different types of food may benefit you. But for instance, a diet where you have a lot of potato and a lot of beef, it does actually cover most of the micronutrients needs just from those two foods, actually, amazingly. Um, <laughs> and do say amazingly. I was going to ask you, because some people can be on a, like, as you mentioned earlier when we began discussing this, a very restrictive diet. So one would think that they are potentially not meeting all of their micronutrient needs. So, you know, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that since you were bringing that up? Are you saying about the beef and the potato? But like, let's say somebody's going on a really restrictive diet one, how can they make sure that they're getting those micronutrient needs and, you know, how long should they be on that, you know, stay in that, in, in a protocol like that? Well, this is where the official line would be, you know, that you should work with a dietitian or a nutritionist if you're going to do any kind of restricted diet. Um, and as I said, from my own personal experience, there is some validity to this, um, that if you are on a highly restricted diet over time, you may well end up with some kind of deficiency even if you think that you're being super healthy, and this could go in any direction. Um, I know this is not popular, but generally animal foods are uh, more nutrient dense. And I say that not as a point of you know philosophy or to antagonize anyone, I'm talking about just from studying nutrient tables. You know, they look at, um, you know, they talk about how things like blueberries or whatever, or spinach are superfoods, but when you look at it, it's just, it's a lot of water and fiber and not a lot else. And you're not meeting your, like any micronutrient um, at a hundred percent by having, you know, a, quite a large unmanageable level of these foods. Now, it all depends on what your goal is. I think like high water content, high fiber content plant foods as like a staple food, 
the reason why it became popular as a strategy is because, of course, it is a low calorie diet. Like you'll you'll fill yourself up without having had a huge amount of calories, as opposed to I don't know a lump of cheese or a lump of fatty meat, where it's so easy. <laughs> Maybe not so much with the meat, but um, you know, definitely it, it, with cheese. <laughs> definitely with cheese. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, you know talk about plant foods as well like you know nuts and seeds and all those kind of things like they're very very calorie dense they're very macronutrient dense and um even yeah dates stuff like that dried fruit or obviously you know table sugar anything like that maple syrup it's very uh macronutrient dense and calorie dense and so you can very easily end up with a lot of calories and there's still loads of space left in your stomach just on a literal level even though you may be satiated or you may not depending on all the stuff we talked about last time but you know if you're having a lot of high water content fruits and vegetables then it's true you're unlikely to overdo it with the macros if, if you're just having a salad uh for instance and you're not adding in nuts and seeds and you're not adding in dried fruits and you're not adding in animal foods it's going to be very very hard to have an excess amount of calories now whether it's even a bad thing to have higher levels of calories. That's something we've discussed previously in the metabolism episode. And I think that's why the pendulum is swinging these days. And like a high plant food, high salad diet is not. People realize it's just often not working. Now, some people argue with that. Oh, well, and if people really, really stuck to it, it would work. Maybe, but people don't stick to it usually. And that's because it's not meeting their needs. So it's not meeting their macronutrient needs to only eat a plant, you know, a uh, salad or, you know, have a juice and that's it every day. Um, and it's uh, also not meeting their micronutrient needs, more interestingly. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. And also, too, in the last episode that we just did that's just going out, I remember my biggest takeaway as well was that you really have to enjoy it for it to have that consistency and for it to last. So if you're doing it as a way of like, oh, just got to get through it, you know, there's no way you can be consistent because that, that enjoyable factor that's allowing you that, that satiation and everything else, it's just not going to be able to be longstanding. And I'm not knocking salads and juices, and I think there is a certain significant percentage of the population that they are beneficial for. And again, we'll talk about that in the next episode. All I'm pointing out is that they are not that high in micronutrients, despite the advertising. That's all I'm saying. Um, with some exceptions, obviously, uh, like, you know, they're fairly high in folate, as I talked about often. Uh, they're definitely high in beta carotene, which is, you know, a precursor of vitamin A, although we don't know if that is necessarily a good thing. They're quite high in vitamin C, um, but usually they're not really very high in the B vitamins. They're not high in, well, they've got no vitamin D. Um, vitamin E, you do mainly get from plant foods, but it really is mainly nuts, seeds, and grains. So all the things that you know, you're generally told are still not that great for you. Um, if you're eating like a, a vegan diet or whatever, usually people are not eating loads, loads of them, or if they are, they're feeling guilty about it. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the minerals, it's not very high in magnesium, it's not very high in uh, zinc at all. You know, it's almost impossible to get enough zinc from a, uh, a plant-based diet. In fact, uh, one of the first articles that I published in like a physical magazine back in or 2010, I think it was a long time ago, um, it was for like a vegan magazine. I was a vegan at the time and I did a long article about how it's possible to get your zinc needs if you're a, if you're a vegan. Uh, and that was speaking as a vegan and it was 
you know, not popular, but I did get a bunch of people reaching out to me saying thank you for making me aware of this. I hadn't even realized, and especially for men, it's very important. I remember I had this idea around that as well that it is possible to get enough iron because actually technically if you look at the food tables, it is there in the food. There is actually quite a bit of iron in a lot of plant foods. But then it was actually speaking to real people and like I ended up in hospital with severe anemia because I was eating plant foods and as soon as I started eating meat, like it reversed and all the rest of it. And and then, you know, I had to look into it more deeply. And yeah, some people, they just do require heme iron, uh, like the plant-based iron, just like the supplemental iron doesn't work for everyone. You could say, unfortunately, because it's always it would be better to have more of uh, options, but that's just the way it is. So... Yeah, what was the original question? <laughs> no, I mean, I think we've pretty much um, discussed it. It was really about, you know, can people get it from food rather than it getting it from a supplement? So, you know, you've really gone around it. Did you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, so I guess the answer is uh, usually yes, actually, especially if you are not having to limit yourself or choosing to limit yourself. If you're not having to or choosing to limit yourself, if you don't have any allergies and intolerances, you don't really have any issues digesting any particular type of food and you're not restricting any type of food for any kind of reasons, whether it's to lose weight or for ethical reasons or whatever else, you are, will be fine with almost all of the nutrients if you're you know, aware and intelligent about it. But if you are restricting for any kind of reasons, if you do have elevated needs for any kind of reasons, we've talked about all of those, um, then it can be tricky. Yeah, that's that's what we were discussing. Is somebody's on a restricted diet for a period of time? Yes, you know what what, what potential damages or what do they need to look out for, and, and should they supplement so that they're not in any kind of deficiency? I know it's like a nerdy thing to do, and for some people, it may be overwhelming to do, and then it's absolutely fine to ask for help with this. But you really should either do this yourself or get someone to do it for you. Go through your food, go through uh, food tables, and see what it is don't assume that you're meeting things don't assume that you're getting enough of everything because you're having a quote-unquote healthy diet or quote-unquote even balanced diet or you know a broad variety um you actually just don't know and so you know the combination as you said earlier christy of testing to actually be sure and i do this every six months roughly sometimes i don't as long as nine months but ever since i did my first test because the first one was so incredibly helpful um i try and do that regularly to make sure that I'm not building up any uh, um, deficiencies, even though I would say you know it's it's you know it's trending in the right direction always and it's getting better and better, um, it is absolutely worth doing because that weakest link in the chain thing. So you did mention um, about being a vegan in um, just a second ago. And so there's that always that big topic of eating meat or not eating meat. And I know that the, you know that is a very big topic out there. There's a lot going on around it for some personal reasons, some health reasons. You know, there are also allergies and intolerances, a lot around dairy, potential dairy products and things like that. Since we're talking about micronutrients, and as you've stated where you can only get some certain micronutrients from certain types of food. My question here is really understanding if somebody is eating a diet and let's say it is a vegan or a vegetarian or something along that way and they that is what they want to do but there are potentially some health hazards that they're coming up because they're choosing to eat a certain way. So whether that's vegan, whether it's vegetarian, or whether for somebody that is an all meat diet, depending on their genetics, and they're not able to um, process certain fats or other things as we talked about in our previous episode, let's say they're eating a healthy diet, whatever kind of diet it is, how do they know and, you know, that they may need to change it, that there may be not potentially, or that they may, may be potentially with the diet they're eating, doing more damage than good? That's a really good question. Um, it won't necessarily show up in ways that we would associate with food. So for instance, for me, it showed up as digestive issues, but for a lot of people, it doesn't, you know? Um, for someone else, it might show up as low energy or, you know, joint pain, or uh, it could even be, you know, depression or something like that. Something that you definitely would never <laughs> probably associate with diet if, uh, you know, if someone wasn't making the connection for you in most cases. So it is a very good question. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the trite answer would be, well, if you're not doing great, then 
But of course, there could be other reasons why you're not doing great. Maybe it's because you're smoking. Maybe it's because you're working 16 hours a day. You know, maybe it's you're sleeping four hours a night. Like, so it's a tricky one to answer, honestly. I know that's not, you know, what people want to hear and it's not the kind of um, message that will make me uh, rich and famous because simple answers are what, uh, <laughs> you know, make you uh, a big established guru in this world, not a, uh, not a complex nuanced answer. But i got to tell the truth. So... There are clues, though, I, I would put it that way. So one of them that we talked about already is like how uh, satiated you are by the meals that you eat. I know that sounds like a silly one. Now, of course, you can fool your satiation signals. So meaning um, highly refined food and especially chemicals, uh, you know, they can kind of trick you into thinking that you're happier about what you're eating than you would be if you were to not have them there. So that is true. Um, the level of like actual hunger that you feel before you eat is an indication certainly of digestive health, but I would say also that you're on the right track in terms of the food you're eating. So meaning if you're eating because you're upset or because you're bored or because your energy is low or because you're tired or whatever, then that is okay if you need to eat you need to eat but that's not optimal what's optimal is that you have a real growling in your stomach like like a real gnawing kind of i'm hungry feeling and you should really be waking up with that and you should be having that you know probably at least one more time a day other than when you wake up to maybe four times two to four times a day like ultimately um so those would be some indicators for it because those are kind of intrinsic relationship that your body has to the food you eat that can't really be fooled or faked you know a lot of stuff can be glossed over with other stuff you know so meaning like maybe the way you're eating is making you fatigued but you drink 10 cups of coffee a day so you don't realize you know or like there's lots of ways to trick the system but as far as i know there's no kind of yeah maybe cannabis but after a while it stops doing this i was going to say there's no drug that kind of gives you that gnawing hunger um, that you will feel when your digestion is genuinely happy with what you're feeding it. So I'd say that's a pretty good indicator. Maybe <laughs> if you take away cannabis as a as a way of uh, tricking that, and you're not taking, you know, um, ghrelin or gro growth hormone as a bodybuilder, maybe they're the, the like the things that would trick that system. But otherwise, that's a pretty foolproof indicator that your body is reasonably happy with what you're giving it. And reasonably, you know, doesn't mean that the diet is perfect. Um, but yeah, I, the more try answer is probably ultimately the best um, indicator, although the obverse isn't true. So meaning, if you're feeling really fantastic, then that is a good sign that you're eating the right diet. Although, of course, just because you're not feeling fantastic doesn't mean that it's the wrong diet. It could be a bunch of other factors. But if it's not those other factors, listen, if you're listening to a podcast like this and you've got this far, you, you probably know a lot of the basic stuff. You probably know a lot of the obvious stuff. You might be ignoring it because of cognitive dissonance, like a lot of people do. Like, I was amazed when I went to um, a health event recently where it was all about healing yourself. I was amazed about the amount of people in the breaks who would not just go out and, like, drink coffee. I know some people think that's good for you or go to the bar in the evening, drink alcohol. Again, I know some people think that's good, good for you. I was amazed at how many people were outside in the breaks smoking. And I'm talking about cigarettes, like normal cigarettes, not even Native American spirit or whatever, which I guess some people still believe that's good for them because it doesn't have all, you know, as many chemicals or whatever. But no, I'm talking about normal cigarettes that are, everyone knows are absolutely full of toxins other than, uh, you know, tar and nicotine and whatnot. So there is that factor as well. But let's just say if someone more objective has analysed what you do, you've been honest with them and they're like, can't see any really good reason for you not to be well right now and you're not well, then it's still not definitely the diet because it could be something that no one's thought of, like mold growing you know, beneath, behind your walls and stuff like that. It can be a lot of different things. Um, but food can definitely you know, play a significant part in it. It is true to say that if, and I, you know, more and more I experience this for myself, the more and more I do believe it's true. When you're on the right fuel, it doesn't make all your problems go away. That's what all the lying, you know, very popular gurus say. If you just eat the right diet, if you just eat a healthy diet, all these things go away. Sometimes it can. I'm not saying they're lying 
that it never happens. I'm saying they're lying that they claim it will be the case for everyone. That it'll be the um, automatic thing. Do this and everything will be good. Yeah. And I've seen people make that claim about veganism. I've seen people make that claim about carnivore, you know, like literally polar opposite uh, <laughs> ways of eating. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that um, there is no foolproof way, unfortunately, of measuring that. But as I said, the way that your body organically, intrinsically responds to food, I don't hear anyone else say this, but that would be my best indicator about um, how much the food you're eating is serving you. And I guess another obvious one that, again, can be misleading in some cases, but which overall I would say is a good one, is uh, how you feel after eating. Now, obviously, if you have digest, and I mean immediately after eating, you know, like an hour within an hour or something. Obviously, if you have digestive issues, it can make you feel worse, even if you're on having the perfect source of fuel. Um, and obviously, if you're doing other things to adjust your moods, that will skew things. So if you're having a coffee after you eat, if you're having a alcohol after you eat, all of that is going to skew things. But let's say you're removing any kind of drug from the equation. Just how do you feel after eating? Do you feel better or worse? It really should be better after you eat. Um, and if you feel worse after you eat, again, could be a sign of severe digestive issues. But more and more I'm seeing people, the more I'm realizing a lot of people I see, they really are on the wrong fuel. And it is more a significant factor than I thought. It's not a significant factor as the gurus make it out to be. Like, all you got to do is eat this way and everything will get better. But it is significant. Okay. All right. So what I'm hearing is there's no foolproof way to tell that, but uh, really assessing of one's body, how they're responding to the food that they're putting in, you know, looking at things, doing tests. And, um, you know, if you're working with somebody, then that can also be um, a way to look at stuff. And so, uh, which brings me back to my next question. We did discuss about, oh, sorry, you want to add something? Yeah, just, uh, you know, at the bottom line, um, if you're not feeling well, that doesn't necessarily mean the food you're eating is wrong. But if you are feeling great on every level, what you're eating is probably about right because it's not really possible to feel great all the time if you're eating totally the wrong food. So, right, right, right. Uh, and, and, and just to clarify, feeling great without uh, cheating, without doing drugs or whatever. <laughs> right, yeah. Good point. Very good caveat. <laughs> um, so you had mentioned previously as we were talk discussing the Nutrival and its importance um, of being able to look at those micronutrients. And I wanted to also ask, because you did discuss about, um, you know, digestion, absorption, utilization, things like that, which is, I've got coming, but this is more about the bacteria within our gut, because you were talking about fiber. We've mentioned it in other episodes um, with the heme, which you were just saying that sometimes it can feed certain bacteria that we don't want it to do. So how important uh, would it be or would you suggest that somebody do a test like GI effects where you're looking at dysbiosis, you're looking at things like that and, um, you know, if there's infections present or food sensitivities for people? Uh, yeah. So GI effects, I don't think they do food sensitivities from what I remember. Um, but that's something we've talked about a lot in part one. So let me just reply to the rest of that. Um, I think it is significant. However, the body's microbiome adjusts pretty significantly depending on the diet you eat. So if you're a fruitarian, for instance, you're going to have a very specific microbiome. If you then, you know, if you're one of those extreme types and you read something and then you decide to go carnivore, um, after I think it's only a few weeks, certainly within a month, you have a very, very different microbiome. Um, it will have adapted to the diet that you're eating, you know, fairly significantly. So it does matter, but um, I, I think that I've, I've said this before, I'm happy to be proven wrong on this and I'm happy to have experts on conflicting opinions on this, but as much as like no one can even decide what the right diet is for you, the human, uh, and they're all experts out there, all of whom have lots of qualifications and all of whom have lots of raving fans saying their system works and all the rest of it, who are all saying completely opposite things. As much as that's true, the science of what is the right thing to feed your microbiome is very young and immature compared to the science of what to feed the human, as it were. So I don't think, um, so people saying, I mean, there are stuff that we do know. So yeah, 
certain fibers will definitely feed certain uh, bacteria that we believe to be beneficial. Certain other things will definitely feed the bacteria that we know are pathogenic, especially if there are too much of them. So I'm not saying it isn't a thing, but what I am saying is um, you might get two people with GIFX tests that have very similar results, and one of them will feel terrible, or one of them will feel okay. Um, and so it's not all the answers. I know that like in functional medicine especially, which I am a fan of, I've talked about it before, it's certainly one of my favorite type of practitioner, but their kind of first thing that they're focused on is what's going on in the gut and what can we do with the gut and let's test the gut maybe and, and let's like remove whatever bad things are there in the gut and then start to restore and rebuild. These are all their, their five steps. Um, I think all of that is important. It's more of the category of digestion. So, you know, we, we talked about that more in the digestion episode and we've done a few episodes in digestion and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of like what diet should I eat to make sure I feed my microbiome, I don't think that's really an issue uh, unless you're trying to resolve a specific digestive issue. So if you're trying to resolve a specific digestive issue and they're like, yeah, you know, you should have, you know, apple pectin and you should have uh, uh, bamboo shoots and you should have this polyphenol and all the rest of it. Sure, I'm not saying not to have any of those things in your diet if, if that's what's being recommended for your specific situation or whatever it is they're saying. Um, great, go for it. But I'm saying I, I don't think there is a lot of proof, you know, like K2, for instance, we talked about K2 earlier. So... You know, K2 is something created by bacteria and there are there is theories that, um, you know, the reason why some people need more is because they don't have the bacteria that create their own and then some people do. But as far as I'm aware, there isn't like a just eat this diet or just eat this food and then you'll, you won't need to supplement K2 because your bacteria will make it themselves. And same with B12, same with anything else. So... Yeah, I, I would only focus on that if you have digestive issues. I guess it's a simple answer. Okay, okay, great. No, really good. Um, then that's going to take me into my next question, which is discussing, you know, digestion, absorption, utilization, elimination. You know, as we've talked about in like the previous episode about um, needing CO2 to actually deliver oxygen to the cells. Um, how can we make sure that the micronutrients that we are ingesting are actually getting to where they need to get to to get the job done? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Well, I've so digestion is a huge part of it, as you just said, right? So digestion is as far as getting it into the blood supply. As far as I'm aware, from the blood supply, uh, well, there's a couple of things. So, you know, oxygen, um, carbon dioxide doesn't just help to, you know, to move oxygen. Wherever oxygen is going, a lot of other nutrients are going as well. So anything that improves circulation, um, you know, both arterial and venous and lymph flow will improve nutrients going in and waste going out. So exercise, uh, you know, even breathing practice, hot, cold, all of that kind of stuff will help the nutrients move. Um, there are certain substances which do like increase the rate that nutrients are, you know, absorbed and taken in that are sometimes used for drugs or for um uh for herbs and stuff like that so for instance uh if you want to make sure that a herb you're taking in goes straight to your liver which is where everything goes when you've eaten it before it gets um distributed then alcohol will do that because alcohol goes straight to the liver so that's where the whole concept of an alcoholic tincture comes from and in fact i don't know really if this is true because i have a time machine but i've heard theories that um you know originally drinking alcohol was a way of delivering herbs and you know that slowly and maybe also other things like psychedelics or whatever and that slowly over time the level of herbs decreased and the level of alcohol increased and we ended up with just alcohol but you know there's still remnants of that right whether it's a jägermeister or there's an absinthe or something like that where um you know there are still some herbs left in the alcohol and even well beer you know beer has got hops beer uh, again i've seen theories that used to have a bunch of different herbs now all it has is like hops, which have like incredibly strong estrogenic effect. So, 
is there a conspiracy behind that? I don't know, like feeding the people who think they're the most masculine, the most uh, feminine uh, <laughs> thing possible, but whatever. So, so yeah, alcohol is a delivery mechanism. Uh, caffeine is a delivery mechanism, which helps to get nutrients into cells. Uh, liposomes are a delivery mechanism. So, you know, for instance, if you know you're low in fat soluble vitamins, then having more fat with your food will help the absorption of that and the transportation, as far as I understand, not just into the bloodstream, but even beyond, like uh, having the fat to go with it. Uh, so yeah, there's liposomal delivery mechanisms, um, which is um, where there's this very small uh, particle which has um, a phospholipid, attached to it. But anyway, sorry, this is more in the realm of supplements. That's not really food-based. Um, so food-based, the main thing, as I understand it, forget all of that for a second because that was all quite niche. The The main thing beyond digestion, like once you got it in the bloodstream, is actually just having um, optimized levels of the other nutrients. So as soon as you've got, you know, for instance, one of the most common ways you can end up with a zinc deficiency is to have like a copper excess for instance, and honestly, even the other way around. Um, and, you know, I talked about, uh, you know, um, B1, uh, you know, if you if your D3 is too low, you can end up with a calcium deficiency, but if your D3 is too high, you can end up with a magnesium deficiency, you know, so it's all of this kind of stuff. So getting like the right levels of other micronutrients, micronutrients is the best way of having optimal levels of all of them as far as i'm aware that's like the number one thing that you want to do uh too little of any important which they all are nutrient can cause an issue with getting having enough of another one but honestly excess can also do it and excess does not only come from supplementation it can also come from food especially if you have a you know very specific diet that focuses on a few things especially if those few things are very high in something i told tell you about dairy but you know what about if you were only having dairy what if you're on a milk-based diet like some people you know were well you're gonna have very low level of uh, sorry very high level of calcium you're not gonna have enough magnesium and potassium that high level of calcium is probably going to imbalance um those other electrolytes even more uh you know you're not gonna have, have zinc either and you know a bunch of other stuff so whenever you're on an extreme of just having one high level of a specific nutrient that can cause deficiency of all the rest as well potentially okay okay so yeah what i'm hearing is really you know to making sure that your digestion is optimal and also just making sure that a lot of things are in balance so that if we're so that we're not um potentially like you said with copper and with zinc pushing one nutrient out more than other because there's there's kind of like a push-pull system with certain uh nutrients correct yeah they're antagonistic to each other is how it's described so it's not just the case that you know let's say you're supposed to have one as one uh zinc to copper it's not just the case if you have two zinc to copper instead that um you're going to have you know, an imbalanced ratio, but you've still got enough copper. No, no, that extra zinc will deplete the copper. So it'll be two zinc and it'll be 0.5 copper or even less. So the way it works is by increasing one, you reduce the other. And that's true for zinc, iron, copper, and molybdenum. They're all antagonistic to each other. And I think there's an episode and a clip about that already in the channel where I go through that in more detail. Um, so, yeah. Now... At this stage, I don't know how many more questions you have, Chrissy, but I know it might all sound very, very complicated to people. So I definitely think we should kind of sum up before we finish, <laughs> get to practicality. Well, you know, we're coming uh, close to the end of my questions here, but uh, one of them I did have was, you know, how important are the micronutrients to how we feel? Because I know in previous episodes, and I can't remember exactly whose work it was, but they were talking about, you know, the need for a certain B vitamin it can have, uh, you know, really impacts um, schizophrenics and things like that. So, you know, that is, you know, that's something that also opened up my eyes into really, you need to pay attention to these micronutrients. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how we feel with, um, with enough or without enough, essentially? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're absolutely crucial. So everything that makes you feel something, 
which is usually, you know, we focus on the neurotransmitters and the hormones, um, are heavily influenced by excess or deficiencies of uh, micronutrients. There's no exception. There's nothing that will not be profoundly affected in terms of how you feel. So, yeah, absolutely massive. I mean, we mentioned magnesium and anxiety, but... Um, uh, you know, with each of the new, you know, with each of the hormones, each of the neurotransmitters, you can go through them one by one. You'll see, um, and you can look this up yourself. Like what? Uh, this is something you could probably these days of AI. It's not super reliable, but you can try it. Um, you can ask what nutritional cofactors are required to make, and then X. So you could say to make dopamine, to make oxytocin, to make thyroxine, to make testosterone, whatever it might be. And again, as I say, I don't know how accurate it is. You can always Google it as well. Um, but you'll get a list and you'll see it's all common stuff. It's zinc, it's magnesium, it's vitamin B6, it's vitamin B2, it's copper, it's it's this, it's that. Like it, it, it's all the stuff that we talk about. Um, and so what does cofactor mean? So a lot of the process of a lot of the process of the body are basically are uh run by enzymes, and enzymes, I like to describe them as little chemical transformation factories. So literally, what an enzyme does is it turns one thing into something else. Sometimes it'll turn, you know, it'll do several of those functions, but let's keep it simple. So in order to turn that one thing into something else, so for instance, in order to turn tyrosine into dopamine, dopamine being the primary feel-good chemical, you talked about feeling good, um, it requires several cofactors and any cofactor that you that that particular enzyme runs out of or it, or even has a suboptimal amount of that's known as rate limiting so that's like the thing that stops it reaching its full potential in terms of production of that thing and so as soon as there is a lack or a relative lack of that then that means that the enzyme I, and one of the main things with enzymes is that they either speed up or slow down. So, you know, it gets very complicated when you think of these, you know, thousands of enzymes all interacting in complex ways. But just very simply, um, a lot of what will control how you feel would be how, let's say with dopamine, how good you feel, how quick is the enzyme working that converts tyrosine into dopamine, and then how quick is the enzyme working that maybe turns dopamine to the next thing, which happens to be noradrenaline, or breaks down dopamine into you know, a metabolite that doesn't make you feel something. Like the speed at which those enzymes work profoundly affects how you feel. What controls the speed at which those enzymes work? Admittedly, a bunch of different factors, but what can stop them doing what your body wants them to do, and it could be a cofactor deficiency. And this is actually way more common than people think or people realize. Um, I'm happy to make that claim. It is something that is massively under-focused on in the medical world compared to what it should be. And my perspective is this is not because it is ineffective to work on this level, but because it is not profitable to work on this level. Um, all the nutrients which make a profound difference, none of them are patentable, um, none of them... You can make money selling them to some degree. I mean, we make a little bit. Um, but the point is, patentable means that you can never make much money. As soon as you have any formula, someone else can just copy you and charge slightly less. And so you, you can never really make significant money. And that's what pharmaceutical companies are interested in. And, and you know, there's a revolving door between heads of pharmaceutical companies and head of the agencies that are supposed to regulate them in, in every country, mine and yours, Chrissy included. Um, pretty much every country. And so, uh, I, so it, you know, just to preempt the question of, well, this makes such a big difference, Owen, oh, why is my doctor not focusing on it? That's really why. And some of them are. Dr. Miriam, who we have on frequently, he was a medical doctor. She's an NHS GP. Uh, she focuses on this stuff. There are plenty of them that do. It's not actually hard to find one probably within your area, within your county, within your state or whatever, but it's just not the majority. And it's almost certainly not going to be the default one that, you know, you, you go to, unfortunately. But you, you can find them, and they understand this stuff uh, just as well as I do, if not more. Um, so I'm not saying it's something no doctors know, but I'm saying that the ones that are firmly in the system will generally not focus on this stuff, except for in very isolated, 
um, extreme cases. I don't know if you've ever watched a medical show in the past, Chrissy, called House MD, with you, Laurie. Yeah, there was there were several cases there where they talked about because they were trying to come up with like interesting diagnoses of either either where nutritional deficiencies or nutritional excesses would create like profound effects in the body. Um, I remember one about Wilson's disease, for instance, where they showed uh, this this young woman I think had become like a psychopath and they couldn't work out. You know, she always was one or whatever, and anyway, it ended up being copper toxicity. You know, um, so you know that's quite good because a lot of people they just learn better through stories than facts. So <laughs> there's a few interesting episodes there that point out extreme cases of that that even the medical establishment would pay attention to. But the sad fact is, you know, most depression and anxiety were just serious enough to adversely affect someone's life, but not serious enough to require hospitalization or any kind of, um, you know, inpatient care, I guess, is like either a uh, nutritional deficiency or otherwise like hormonal deficiency or excess is probably a root factor, if not the root factor, and it's just usually ignored. No, I, that's, yeah, that's, it's a shame. It's a shame. Um, the, then my final question before we get into the practical sides of it is really when looking at micronutrients and let's say somebody's really good or, or maybe they're not really good, you know, let's say they're eating, you know, a, a fast food diet, a highly processed diet, or, you know, you've got the other person over here that's, you know, been really good, but then like they'll on the weekend, they're like, oh, I'm going to, you know, treat myself or things like that. You know, how impactful is that on an individual's micronutrient needs? needs and so how often are we talking so you're going to have the one person over here that that's all they eat they're going to just eat the highly processed they're eat and take out all the time da, 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 da. and then you have the other person that's pretty good five days a week but on the weekend they splurge okay just two two days out of just, seven. Yeah. got it yeah so what's the difference on the micronutrient intake yeah looking at looking at what's gonna yeah impact them how severely would eating that way potentially, you know, detrimentally impact them with their micronutrient needs? It's hard to say the fast foods, like, uh, you know, are they having like um, a lot of cheeseburgers or are they having a lot of potato chips? Um, you know, I guess like it, it varies a little bit. I would say the problem with the highly processed diet is, dep again, depending on what the person's having, is probably less the micronutrient deficiencies and it's probably more the toxins that are in there whether it's like the obvious stuff to people like us like the seed oils in massive quantities or the soy or you know the you know, the pesticides the the heavy metals the fungus the um pcbs the uh, phthalates the microplastics the all of that kind of stuff is probably going to have a more adverse effect on health than the impact on micronutrients. Because, because the truth is, um, like, let's say if, if someone's having a lot of beef in terms of a burger from McDonald's, or if they're having a lot of beef from like a grass fed steak, the actual beef, the micronutrients are not going to be specifically, there's not going to be a huge difference between them, honestly. The, McDonald's one, let's assume that it's pure beef in both cases. The McDonald's one, you know, it's, it's going to be somewhat higher in omega-6s because of what the animal's fed. But, like, that's not really the problem with the McDonald's one. The problem is all the poison <laughs> that comes with it uh, and the hormones that the animal's injected with, you know, and, and on and on and on. Um, that's really the issue, not the and the preservatives and, and all the chemicals. That's going to be the issue, not the micronutrient difference per se. That's why kind of what I was trying to like, think about it and trying to qualify it. It really depends what the fast food is. Now, if the fast food is pizza, for instance, and that's all the person eats, then, you know, that's a different problem, potentially, right? You know, if, you, if you're basically just having tomatoes, uh, wheat, and cow dairy, you know, maybe with whatever toppings you like, um, then, yeah, that's going to be more of a micronutrient deficiency, uh, potentially, if you're having KFC, you know, it's a different thing again. But, you know, generally dairy, as much as it's been helpful for me, is going to be less complete when it comes to micronutrients to, like, than poultry. And poultry is going to be less complete than beef, which is obviously a, 
uh, what's the word, like a generalization. There are specifics where poultry is better or there are specifics where dairy is better, but, you know, as a generalization. So it does depend uh, a little bit in terms of micronutrients. But, yeah, the main thing I guess to get is the real problem of the processed diet isn't so much the lack of micronutrients, depending on what it is they're having. Now, if the, if the junk food processed diet is like, you know, like the cheapest form of chocolate bars and Pringles potato chips, then, yeah, there is a big difference in micronutrients because there's going to be very little micronutrients in like your potato corn chips or breakfast cereal or you know or whatever or something like that um versus like a real diet so it does depend a bit on the fast food when it comes to micronutrients it's probably not the answer you're expecting but it no, probably but it's helpful well. it is helpful because then you're you're thinking like oh okay wait a minute you know you know overall we're really looking at getting the best form of micronutrients from our whole unprocessed, you know, whole foods, organic and, and, and things like that. But, um, but what I'm also hearing is like, that it's not necessarily an absolute disservice if you are eating some of those highly processed and eating out in different places as much as it could have possibly been. Like, granted, it's not the best diet for you for many other reasons, but um, from a micronutrient need space. Let's put it this way. Like a double cheeseburger with, you know, a bun, but that's it from McDonald's or whatever, Burger King, any of those other companies. It's probably more micronutrient dense than like a, you know, white rice and salad meal that someone might think is being super healthy from some kind of restaurant of all whole foods or whatever. That's the thing to realize. The um, Now... Am I saying that the double cheeseburger is better than white rice and salad? No, because the bacon, bacon double cheeseburger is also full of poisons, as I said. But the problem with it is that it's full of poisons, not necessarily that it's so low in micronutrients. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Well, we discussed, you know, thank you for going through and answering and discussion, discussing those questions that I had. Now you, um, we just, we, uh, we're talking about getting into the practical side of these micronutrients. So, so kick, a, to kick us off here, Ellen, where, where would you like to go? Well, I thought about how to do this. And I think the best way is to go back to what we did before, but just quickly review it. And so again, if you haven't watched the previous episode, I'm not going to do this all over again or it'll take ages. But what I mean by that is just go for the three macronutrients, go for your options with each. Again, briefly, because we've already done this. And then just say new uh, paradigm to look at it through, which of these different options is best from a micronutrient point of view, right? So we'll do with protein, carbs, and fat. Okay, so in terms of protein, um, we talked about, so there is uh, fish, poultry, red meat, lentil, uh, pulses, lentils, beans, grains, nuts and seeds. Uh, I think that's it. So out of those, which is the best for a broad selection of micronutrients? Now, obviously, ideally, um, you have some variety. So, for instance, we talked about this. You might have some dairy because it's the only major source of calcium. But if that's the only source of protein, then you're going to be deficient in a lot of micronutrients that the other ones have. 
Um, out of all the protein sources, I would say you know, the most micronutrient dense that you're going to go with would be a combination of um, red meat and fish. Those would be the most micronutrient dense, probably. Now, often people who red meat is good for them, fish is not good for them. People who fish is good for them, red meat is not good for them. Not always, but often. So I'm not saying just oh, those two protein sources. I'm just saying those two are pretty good. Um, now, also, for micronutrients, like, actually, beans are not bad. Beans and pulses. Um, out of the vegan sources, they have, like, a, you know, a fair collection. So they may not agree with you for other reasons, like we talked about last time, but if they do, they're a pretty good source. Some of the grains um are pretty good but generally not the ones that are most popular so rice corn wheat wheat is probably the highest micronutrient out of those three um but obviously it doesn't agree with a lot of people and it's still not great and a lot of time it's you know full of glyphosate and all kinds of other stuff so you might not want to have it for those reasons um some grains are better but no grain is really that great with micronutrients um nuts and seeds are actually not bad in micronutrients so thiamine, we talked about that, B1, how it's kind of low in everything. So some of the best sources of B1 are, I think, actually the nuts. I think uh, macadamia is one of them, almonds maybe, can't remember exactly. But, you know, so, uh, and then, you know, pumpkin seeds. Um, so do I recommend those? Other than macadamia, no, because they're full of omega-6s. But <laughs> in terms of micronutrients, I'm just acknowledging they are fairly dense. So if you're going to eat them anyway, then at least... You're getting a fair amount of micronutrients from that particular protein source so you know that's a benefit as well um and you know i'm not a fan of poultry so i'm probably prejudiced against it um i would not i can't see any reason why you would prefer poultry over red meat other than just because you prefer it you actually like it better in which case fair enough um but nutritionally there's not really anything about it that's better than red meat so i guess that's why it's not on the top of the list but poultry is you know pretty micronutrient dense as well What's the takeaway from this? Actually, probably that most protein sources are pretty micronutrient dense, both plant and animal. Uh, probably the least actually is dairy, you know, other than calcium and K2, like we've talked about, and probably grains. But all of them are actually not bad. So if you're thinking like, well, everyone's kind of said everything's okay, then yeah, that uh, actually is kind of the case. <laughs> they are all okay. Um so if we now if I now go to fats, so main source of fats would be fatty cuts of meat, both red meat, poultry, dairy again, um, nuts and seeds again, uh, fish again, um, in terms of natural sources, uh, that's pretty much it. And then, oh, and then, sorry, the fatty uh, fruits would be the last one. So that's like olives um, and uh, durian and uh, what's the other fatty... Uh, fatty fruit thank you avocado yes exactly um so out of those which are the most macronutrient dense uh, sorry yeah, micronutrient dense again they're all pretty good you could put red meat up there you could put again dairy maybe close to the bottom other than calcium and k2 uh, although those certainly have their value and dairy does have a good um, uh, selection of amino acids so i'm not down on dairy it's just not very good for most micronutrients um nuts and seeds again actually pretty good for a lot of micronutrients the only problem is that almost all of them have high levels very high levels of omega sixes um fish pretty good so again right not a bad selection from the fat sources uh so any of those will give you a pretty good selection that i mentioned probably in that order again so meat and uh, red meat and fish at the top uh, then poultry, then nuts and seeds, um, then fatty fruits, then dairy probably at the bottom in terms of just breadth and level of micronutrients. But all not bad, even dairy at the bottom, not bad. Then there's carbs. So carbs are like the first one where you can get a lot of calories without a lot of micronutrients and sometimes even the food that's perfectly fine so like your your any refined grain and i'm not necessarily against refined grain because often the 
um, the part of the grain that is removed is full of lectins. Uh, it's much more likely to go rancid quickly. It's much more likely to have toxins in it. So the brown part of brown rice that they remove to make white rice, right? The um, the uh, the bran. It has most of the nutrients. It also has most of the toxins and the irritants. So there's a good case for removing it potentially. But if you remove it, white rice has got almost nothing in it. You know, corn has got almost nothing in it in terms of micronutrients versus calories. Um, so the grains, you know, not very good. Fruits, um, okay, pretty good. Um, I would say as calorie sources of micronutrients, but not great. Not not as good as you know a lot of what we've been talking about. Not as good as any of the protein sources we talked about. Calorie per micronutrient, which is really how I look at it. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. Um, how what level of micronutrients you're getting per calorie? You want it to be, you know, pretty high. But you also want to be getting calories. So, for instance, to go back to like your green leaves, the level of micronutrients to calories is very high with green leaves. But the problem is um, the level of calories and micronutrients is so low in them that it's kind of negligible. And you could eat, you know, a kilo of green leaves and get nowhere near either your calorie needs or your micronutrient needs. Um, I know it is high in a couple of things, like we said, uh, like minerals, like calcium, but then they're bound up, you know, often in a way that they're not actually absorbable, bound up to oxalates or phytates or whatever. So that's potentially a problem. Um, now, you know, going back to what I said, I mentioned earlier about beans and grains, they are pretty high in micronutrients, but there is the problem potentially of, you know, that they're more difficult to digest, even if you digest them um you know pretty well uh they they just have more things that stop you from being able to fully make use of the nutrition than animals why just because animals are better no it's just the way that animals avoid being in is to fight back run away or hide the way that plants avoid being in is to produce toxins to stop you eating them and some of those toxins bind to the nutrients and stop you making use of those nutrients. So that's just the way it is. So even though it's there, when you take it apart and break it down into components and do lab tests on it, it's not necessarily going to be used as efficiently by your body, unfortunately. So in terms of carb sources, um, yeah, as I said, fruits, not bad, but they're not, you're not really getting many B vitamins from fruits. You are getting C, you're not getting any D, you're not getting any E except for uh, the fatty fruits, you know, olives or whatever. Um, you're not really getting much magnesium. You're not getting much, you know, most of the micronutrients other than potassium. So fruits are basically high in potassium, high in sugar, high in water, high in fiber, and there's a little bit of other nutrients. So they're very niche thing, basically, in the same way that dairy is a niche thing. Not bad but it's not a broad selection. It's like specifically high in potassium. Oh, and it's specifically high in other nutrients, which, you know, there's a lot of benefits claimed for them, like the polyphenols and anthocyanins and bioflavonoids and all that other stuff, but they're not essential nutrients that the body needs to live. That's why they're not classified as vitamins or minerals or, or amino acids or essential fat. There's something else. And of course, some people say they're not even good for you. <laughs> I'm on the side of saying that all those things may be good for you, but they're medicines, not nutrients. Your polyphenols, your triterpenes, your anthocyanins, all of those kind of things. Yes, they have a poison-like quality to them, but yes, they can also really help people. That's because they're medicinal, they're not really nutritional. And so that's why I'm saying with fruit, basically talking water, sugar, as in you know, fructose and glucose, um, fiber, and potassium. That's the main thing that we've got going on with fruit. So there's not a huge selection, just like with dairy. Um, other than that, we've talked about grains already, talked about beans already, talked about the potential issue of those. There's root vegetables. Root vegetables, I would say, not only are they the uh, less problematic in terms of digestion and getting the nutrients out of them, like you have issues with grains and beans. With grains and beans, you've got to kind of ideally soak them and sprout them and ferment them and all of this stuff. Um, root vegetables, you don't have to do any of that. Root vegetables still have their own plant toxins in them that like stop you from eating too much in, in various, you know, depending on which one to various degrees. Um, but the micronutrient ratio of them is okay. 
compared to a protein source and actually pretty good compared to a carb source. So that's why for me, you know, root vegetables are my preferred carb source. They, they have more of a broad selection. I talked about potatoes earlier. Potatoes obviously um, are nightshades. They potentially have high levels of solanine, which is a plant toxin. So I'm not saying that they are risk-free. But overall, if you're getting a 1,000 calories from potato or a 1,000 calories from whatever your favorite fruit is, oranges, bananas, whatever, they have a better micronutrient profile, potatoes, much more balanced you know, across the board rather than you know, just high in potassium and not much else, like in the case of fruit. So that's why I prefer them, not just on a practical level, but also on a, on a theoretical level, um, the root vegetables. Now, in terms of the sweeteners, like your maple syrup, your honey, your agave, your table sugar, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so table sugar, white sugar is going to be the least high in micronutrients. Probably the highest of micronutrients of all the sweeteners is probably molasses um, or the very dark sugar, like the clump, the kind of sugar that clumps in is very dark. There is actually quite a lot of micronutrients in that. Maple syrup has a bit. It's actually not bad. Honey has a bit. It's okay. It's actually not bad. Um, agave has very little. And then, yeah, white sugar has none in the case of micronutrients. Um, just thinking, are there any other carb sources I missed that we talked about last time? No, I don't think so. So overall, uh, as I said, my favorite would be root vegetables for micronutrients, as well as the fact that those micronutrients are actually absorbable. But I know some people, fruit just works better for them digestion-wise, then that's fine. Um, we're not saying in this one, abs like absolutely what's better, we're only talking about not micronutrients. Great, beautiful rundown. And yes, please, everybody, if you hadn't checked out the previous episode, do check that out. We'll make sure that you have the link below. Um, this has been really, really great and a great deep dive into the micronutrients and really understanding their importance as you talked about the cofactors and what it takes to build what our body needs. Um, is there, you know, I, th I think we've pretty, go ahead, you've got something yeah. to say. Yeah. Well, yeah. Did you notice there was one category of food that everyone always talks about that was not in my rundown there of uh, options? Yeah, I was going to say soy or things like that. <laughs> so soy is a pulse, a bean, in terms of what it actually is, and it's like a nut uh, or seed in terms of its nutrient. So most beans are like protein and carbs, like we talked about last time. Soy is protein and fat. So I just put it in the uh, fat category. Now, I was just going to talk about, but I realized it was a confusing question because I did mention them a little bit. Um, vegetables. Everyone always talks about vegetables. Vegetables are so healthy. Vegetables are so important. Vegetables are so good for you. Vegetables are so full of nutrition. It wasn't on my list. Vegetables, um, and there are exceptions, kind of, but they're not really very high in micronutrients. Now, again, as I said earlier, micronutrient to calorie ratio, yes. And if you're trying to make yourself feel full while eating less calories, then it's true. Having a bunch of, and when, when I say vegetables, I mean, you know, I include salad, right? Your lettuces and all that kind of stuff. Uh, cucumber, tomato, you know, whatever, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but they, they're high in, again, other plant compounds. You know, you, your tomatoes are high in lycopene um, and your, your you know, green vegetables are high in chlorophyll and whatever, all these niche, you know, compounds, but they are not high in nutrients. In the case of, you know, vegetables, salads, all the rest of it, they're not high in macronutrients and they're not high in any micronutrients to any significant level either. Not really. I mean, vitamin C is probably the cl closest to them actually being high in anything. As I said, folate, you know, in some cases, fairly high uh, in some vegetables. A um, couple of other B vitamins sometimes. But, uh, you know, copper sometimes, but often that can be an issue. When people on plant-based diets, they end up way too high in copper versus zinc. So it's not always a good thing. So, you know, and now, am I saying all this to justify not eating vegetables? No, I do actually eat some vegetables, not just every day, every meal. But I treat it as a, um, like a fiber source and for some taste and for some moisture because I tend to, my constitution is to tend to feel dry. 
I do not fool myself into thinking that this is a bounty of nutrition. <laughs> it just it just isn't. That's a really good point. Uh, it, you know, a bounty of nutrition. Yes, absolutely. It's not necessarily so micronutrient dense. But you do bring up a good point about there about hydration because you know one of the things I've always thought, and please you know share your perspective on this, is that dehydration. Yes, yeah, sure, it's about drinking water, and making sure we're hydrating enough, but it's also about getting some hydration from the foods that we eat as well. Well, so it depends on your definition. So hydration, yeah, is a combination of liquid, water, and then uh, electrolytes. I guess that would be the simple answer. So electrolytes are the macro micronutrients. So they're the most abundant. So we're talking about calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, chloride, phosphate, maybe carbonate as well. So like six or seven of them. Um, so those micronutrients are also generally, like I was saying, pretty low in vegetables. I said fruits are fairly high in potassium, kind of vegetables are usually medium. Vegetables are kind of medium in calcium, though it's not very well absorbed. Vegetables are low to medium in magnesium. So they're not really high in any micronutrient either. Um, so when I was saying moist, I just literally meant like, in terms of like the feeling in your mouth, I don't think that they're really um, like hydrating you uh, to any significant degree personally, uh, unless you're having a lot, I guess. You know, obviously if you're having a liter of green juice or something, then yeah, that's gonna be hydrating you because it's a liter of what's mainly water. As I just said, it's mainly water and fiber. So yeah, of course. Um, but I don't think there's anything magical about them that are hydrating, both from a personal perspective and from a scientific perspective like you know there's nothing particularly about them that you know milk or uh, anything else that just water or anything else that's not considered you know fruits or vegetables won't do just as well that has some liquid and some electrolytes um so yeah i don't i think um potassium i think a lot of people Although they're not deficient in potassium, they have suboptimal levels. And so, and especially if you like salt, and a lot of people who are on these extreme diets are actually quite stressy people, and stressy people like salt. So most of them are having quite a lot of salt. So I can imagine there's something quite quenching about like coconut water or fruits, juice, or eating fresh fruits and stuff like that, because it's pretty high in potassium. So that's balancing that out quite nicely. And that may be like helping with the whole hydration issue. So that's a possibility. Um, but as a, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing innately that I understand through any science or even any other system through, you know, TCM or Ayurveda or any other system really that fully explains and justifies why, you know, water bound up in a cucumber or in a grape is any more hydrating than the water in a glass with just some electrolytes added. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, great list. <laughs> thank you for answering the questions that we did. And I know, um, again, for anybody that can refer back to our other previous episodes on the Feel Younger Diet, is there anything before we come to a close here that you want to add to anybody on your final thoughts that you want to share with the listeners? Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, leave them underneath. I answer all questions on YouTube. Uh, if you're not listening to this on YouTube, then that's fine, but go ahead to YouTube if you wanna ask any questions. Uh, please do support the podcast by um, you know, considering our service, Genetic Insights. And I do have a book coming out soon-ish. Hopefully it won't be that long now, um, which is you know the Rejuvenate Blueprint, the complete guide to uh, optimizing your health uh, and longevity. I'm not sure if that's the title exactly, but it'll be that's roughly the topic of it. Um, and so, you know, I'm still very much enjoying that interaction with you guys to like learn what you're interested in and all the rest of it. So, if you ask a question, it may the answer to it may well show up in the book, or uh, if you tell me your experience or whatever. So, yeah, keep the conversation going and please do share it with people who you think would appreciate it. And if you think I've kind of left out the whole issue of, you know, oh, but how do I know what suits me? Is, is uh, you know, red meat better for me? Is vegetarian better for me? Is fish better for me? That'll be the next diet episode we do. So that's coming soon.
Beautiful, Elwin, as always. Thank you so much for bringing your expertise, your dedication, and everything that you do to this podcast. And thank you so much to our beautiful listeners for joining us and for staying here through the end. There's always, we so much appreciate, we look forward to your comments. We look forward to your interactions with us. So keep them coming. Even if it's just to put, you know, an emoji or something, thumbs up saying, yeah, that um, you visited. It, it really does help with the podcast. It helps with, you know, the algorithm and everything else. So, you know, your, your, um, uh, feedback, everything like that supports us so that we can keep supporting you. So please remember to hit that like and subscribe button, the bell icon, so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.